This is the first ever proper independent tourist guide to Britain and the 1887 first edition changed everything. The whole of Great Britain is in this book. It's about 500 pages. It tells you everything you need to know, everywhere you need to go. It helped to create the independent traveller and opened up Britain as a tourist destination for Americans wanting to experience the dynamism of the Industrial Revolution and the excitement of being able to travel for pleasure. I'm starting my tour by looking at something you don't get to see very often. I'm in Liverpool and one of the world's most famous ships, the QE2, is tying up for the last visit it'll ever make to the city. It's an exceptional scene that a hundred years ago when my Baedeck was published, the sight of travellers pouring off ships like this was much more common. Liverpool was then one of the busiest ports in the world and it was here where the vast majority of transatlantic journeys began and ended. And it was the Baedeker Guide to Great Britain that would have been in the pockets of most of the well-educated American travellers as they made their first intrepid steps on British soil. Now that is a view, isn't it? It's how you're supposed to see Liverpool. It's not supposed to be down there on the ground, it's supposed to be up here on the level of the building. That's great. And they all say in Baedeker, that you can see the whole of Liverpool from the boat. The view, in fact, would have seemed remarkably familiar to many of the passengers that arrived here. It is the most maritime city. You know, you don't get this in London or Southampton. This looks like a proper port. The letters I've read of Americans coming in say that it's, uh, it's part English, part American. They always compare Liverpool to New York. It's a bit New york <laughs> Baedeker lists nine transatlantic liners arriving here in Liverpool each week. For many of these passengers, it was the trip of a lifetime. They were generally comfortably off business people, here to broaden their horizons and improve themselves. Where better to start than what was the busiest trade hub in the biggest empire in the world? The first destination for many tourists would have been just a hundred yards from the quayside and through these doors. So this is the Cunard building, which was the head of operations of the transatlantic liners of Cunard. It's a fantastic classical building. And this electric line, all the electric line here, was, was kind of new technology. So this grand classical interior and all this light, so kind of celebration of the wealth and power of the company. And what a great place to buy your ticket to go to America. I mean, you know, what would you rather do, buy one on the internet or come here? and get your ticket. Much more drama of travel. Excuse me. All there. Where would where would you get the tickets? The, the ticket office was actually the side of the front side. There seems to be little evidence left of the millions of passengers who must have passed through these halls. Oh, right. And there will be hundreds of people in here all queuing up for things. Yeah, the first class passengers arrive at the strand side. Yes, it's also the tickets and the passports, changing the currency, and then if you part to the pay ahead side. And did they have things like refreshments and all that sort of stuff then? Yeah, well the first class passenger taxi went to the sixth floor, the ballroom, to be entertained by the directors of the queue. Really? Yes. Wow. You can't get that now, do you? Yeah, no. <laughs> Tony tells me that just below the grand entrance hall, there are still a few reminders of the past. This is the big place. Of course, a long way down. Yeah, there's actually three floors below street level. Three floors below street level. Deep in the basement is something not normally seen by modern day tourists. This is where the second and third class passengers kept their baggage. How many people came through here? Must be thousands. So was each section for one person? No, each section of the rack, and there was a number on each side of the rack. The links of which part of the ship the luggage was going to. Cunard left this building in the mid 1960s after the passenger business moved to Southampton. But left behind on the shelves here are just a few reminders of the last days of the transatlantic trade. It's 
an old 60s paper from the last time the Cunard were here. Love Tangle of GI on Death Trial. He killed his wife for a married woman. So the newspapers haven't changed. I wonder how many Baydeckers came through there. If you didn't have one, you know, you'd have a tough job getting around. You'd have to ask people, you'd need a lot of help. Whereas at least if you had one, you know, it would really smooth your path through any country. It was the meticulous detail in the Baedeker Guide that made them so useful. Maps, plans, railway routes, hotel and restaurant prices were all included. And that meant a stranger could find their way around most places with just one pocketable guide. The great value of the Baylor Guide was that it was small, incredibly detailed, full of information, full of easy to read maps and easy to read plans. All you needed when you travelled was a little red guide. All the guides were published in Germany by Baedeker, but my guide to Great Britain was written by a Scotsman, J.F. Muirhead. He was a typical man of his time, not so much interested in high culture or art as people, industry and politics. And it was the docks, all seven miles of them, that he thought one of Liverpool's most interesting attractions. This was a booming, exciting city, one of the biggest ports in the world, and Victorians like Muirhead were fascinated by it. He points out that the growth of the docks had swelled the population of Liverpool from only 5,000 when the first dock was built to almost three quarters of a million by the time my guide was published. Tourists then would marvel at the sheer industry and energy of the place. And although the outlying docks are still busy, those in the city centre are finding new uses. Offices, shops, museums and restaurants now create a buzz about the place and the docks have yet again become a tourist attraction. One of the suggestions highlighted in Baedeker sounded very intriguing. Time five, number five is Road, which was the uh, Bose Museum for Japanese art. And it had one of the finest collections of Japanese art in the country at the time. I just had to see if anything was left of it. This could be it, this one on the left here. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's pretty fantastic. Uh, it's a sort of castle, but a blocked up castle. So I'm going to get out and have a closer look. Number five. I wonder if this is the old museum sign. It's in between a church and uh, another church. We'll go and have a look. Ah, it's a window over here. It's full of white goods. They must do a lot of laundry here. Yeah, you can just see the B. This was uh, the Bose Museum of Japanese Art. So I assume that's his initial. There's a bell here. I forgot the ring. Well, there's no answer. I was hoping to get in, because you never know what these places are like when you're inside. Although I couldn't find my way inside, I was pleased to see that the outside of the building did give away some clues to its past. I wonder if it was a house and the museum had a separate entrance. Because if you look here, this is like a, a public entrance and then you've got a gallery upstairs. If you look along the uh, cornice here, you can see Japanese symbols like the chrysanthemum pattern and the rest of the building is Gothic so I think this signified that this was the, in the entrance to the Japanese Museum and it's great, this is a, one of the best things about Baedeker's now is you just find things that have been lost and you're kind of discovering things again